The 70s was a fertile landscape for black culture to evolve, grow, and begin penetrating the mainstream. It was also an interesting time for black political thought. That's the only thing I agree with. Black folks trying to loot when they should be shooting. If you're gonna loot, loot your gun store. And I don't particularly care whether I walk alongside, in back of, or in front of. That is going to have to be defined for me by my man. The black look also began to change. The reality of black life in the 70s directly speaks to the reality of black life now. So, pay attention. Another lady ain't gonna do nothing but get ripped up again, send to prison and get shot or something. We'll get more and more and more. Hey man, how, how far can we go? Los Angeles, 1977. Kermit Washington of the LA Lakers has just punched Houston Rockets player Rudy Tomjanovich after an unclear scuffle that Rudy was attempting to mediate. The punch fractured Rudy's face, and he was left unconscious in a pool of blood. Rudy eventually sued the Lakers and Washington for $2.6 million in damages, and the jury was so horrified that they awarded him $3.3 million. This punch would earn Kermit a $10,000 fine and a 60-day no-pay suspension. This punishment equaled ones for players who gambled on games or players caught using steroids. But fights? Previously, such fines were around $250 to $2,500. During the 1976 season, for example, there were 41 fights and the highest fine was $2,500. Shit, fan violence in the basketball stands had grown in the late 70s, and journalist Peter Greenberg spoke with experts who found white working class fans were usually at the center of such fights. But this punch of a white man from a working class background by a black man was heard round the world. It was played repeatedly on TV and featured in newspapers. Kermit received hundreds of racist letters and death threats saying things like, all you black niggers are the same, animals. This spoke to a larger, long-held belief that black male violence was exceptional and pathological, and that white male violence is not. The punch was an event that made basketball fans long for the NBA golden age of the 50s and 60s, where the workforce was mainly white. Teams had an unofficial quota for black players, three or four, max. The 70s is what is sometimes referred to as the NBA's dark ages, where 75% of the players were black and there was more aggressive street ball style play. NBA lawyer David Stern said in the late 70s that the league was seen as too black, too violent, and too drug involved. Meanwhile, the violence that occurred in hockey, a largely white sport, was spun as an outlet for the silent majority to vent their frustrations and became a celebrated part of the sport. But hostility towards black players was deeper than gameplay styles, violence, or accusations of drug use. Prior to 1964, players had no pension or health care benefits and were given a $7 per day allowance. Conditions changed when the NBA began recognizing the National Basketball Players Association, which has since grown to be one of the most powerful and effective unions in the world. Black players, who in the 70s were becoming the bulk of the NBA, were reaping the benefits of the players' union in a time when the country was experiencing recurring economic turmoil. Their behavior on and off the court was criticized. Team owners, league officials, and white commentators spun them as greedy, ungrateful, and lazy. I'm not saying the players shouldn't be fine for fighting, but the sensationalization of the punch and the death of Kermit Washington's career and reputation for decades to come reflected America's own distaste for the new race dynamics. As the 60s came to an end, white liberals celebrated civil rights wins, but many were shocked when black people and other racial minorities refused to adapt to white culture or continued protesting various issues, fucking up fantasies for a cohesive American identity or melting pot. It certainly didn't help matters that by the 70s, black culture and talent was available for consumption more than ever, giving the community more power. Black people weren't just 75% of the NBA and over 30% of the NFL in the 70s. They were increasingly popping up on TV and in the movies. Popular TV shows included Good Time, Sanford and Son, Fat Albert, That's My Mama, and Soul Train. It will be necessary to get a detailed report of the circumstances surrounding A, the burglary itself, and B, the nature of the physical assault perpetrated on the victim. 
<laughs> he wants to tee on what got snatched and how you got wiped out. <laughs> In 1977, Roots debuted to critical acclaim and had 28 to 36 million viewers for all eight of the days that the miniseries was broadcasted. After two years of production, we present this incredible saga in an epic motion picture. Roots, the current number one best-selling novel, is the television event of the year. From primitive Africa to the Old South. Black culture was being recognized in academic circles, too. Black studies programs became more numerous during the decade, increasing interest in black history and contributions to literature, art, and politics. And the 1970s also saw an explosion in black literary culture that reflected contemporary themes of race, motherhood, womanhood, and class. Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye was published at the top of the decade, and her work as an editor helped propel other black authors into publication. In 1970, the Color Purple author Alice Walker published an essay titled Looking for Zora, which helped renew attention to Zora Neale Hurston's 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Popular music, namely rock and roll, became more white and male in the early 70s, and black musicians who found mainstream success were performing more pop and dance soul music. Acts like Gladys Knight and the Pips, the OJs, Stevie Wonder, and Dionne Warwick were very popular, but the group that was perhaps only second to the Beatles in terms of establishing modern day stand culture was the Jackson 5, who dominated the charts for the first two years of the 70s. Michael Jackson would go on to release the critically acclaimed Off the Wall in 1979. Then there was, of course, disco music, which found its primary audience in black people, Latinos, women, and gays attending dance parties. For most of American history, integrated dance halls were frowned upon, so disco was a phenomenon also because it brought together integrated audiences who danced in close spaces. It was eventually packaged to be an upscale and white fixture of gay clubs, but it would always be associated with black people because it was influenced by R&B, soul, and funk. Therefore, when I think of disco, I think of Donna Summer, Sister Sledge, Chic, and Grace Jones. Some black music snobs hated disco, believing it was assimilationist and whitewashed funk. In a way, they were right, as many of disco's producers by the late 70s were white. By 1979, radios were switching to all disco formats. There were over 20,000 disco texts to go shake your ass in, and that year, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack won Album of the Year at the Grammys. A Chicago DJ named Steve Dahl claims he was fired shortly after his former rock station switched to disco, and he began printing Kill Disco membership cards and holding Death to Disco rallies where people could come smash records. It's really no surprise that suburban white boys saw disco as too black or too gay or too feminine, so they coined the term disco sucks. In July 1979, the Chicago White Sox, who had fledgling attendance numbers, sponsored a disco demolition with Steve Dahl at the helm. Fans who brought a disco record could get in for less than a dollar. This event attracted nearly 50,000 people, most of them white teens. A black usher who worked the stadium named Vince Lawrence noticed that people were bringing not just disco records, but records by black artists in general. Dahl led a chant of disco sucks before a crate of records was blown up in the outfield. A second game was supposed to occur, but the crowd went nuts and began rioting, so the Sox had to forfeit. The event increased backlash towards disco, and record companies stopped producing it and radio stations stopped playing it. While black music, visual media, literature, and sports stars seemed to suddenly dominate the national landscape, political organization continued to strike fear into white hearts when they heard about it. Much of the black political activism that happened in the 70s has gone unchronicled in mainstream media and historical study. Moderate white Americans who had supported black voting rights in the 60s no longer believed that racism was a threat in the 70s. When capitalism increasingly became criticized, this hurt support as well. Opinion polls from the period revealed that black rights stopped being an important issue for the general public, inevitably encouraging
encouraging media outlets to ignore black protests or malign them when they were covered. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a lot of stuff going down. There was Benjamin Chavis, who organized a nonviolent campaign in Wilmington, North Carolina to improve education for black children. He and nine associates, eight black and one white, were arrested on charges of conspiracy and arson when a white-owned store was burned down in February 1971. The Wilmington 10, as they came to be known, were found guilty and sentenced to a combined 282 years, with Chavis earning 34. He was only 24 years old. There was zero evidence implicating them in the crime, and at least one juror was a KKK member. Despite this and numerous appeals, the Wilmington 10 remained in prison until 1979, even after testimony in 1977 from a key witness who admitted he had been bribed. In Charlotte, North Carolina, an elaborate conspiracy straight out of a movie sent three young black activists to prison. The Charlotte Three, Jim Grant, T.J. Reddy, and Charles Parker, had all collaborated with University of North Carolina Charlotte students in 1969 to agitate the administration into creating a black studies program. They achieved this goal, and unfortunately, this is when the FBI began keeping tabs on them through COINTELPRO. The FBI came to collaborate with the NC State Bureau of Investigation the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and Charlotte Police to surveil these men. Grant, in particular, was a major threat because not only was he a journalist and organizer for racial issues, but he helped organize local sanitation workers into a nationwide union. Exhibiting this kind of class solidarity is why the ATF referred to him as one of the top militant leaders in the state of North Carolina in a 1971 memo. That same year, the ATF, the Treasury Department, North Carolina prosecutor, Charlotte police, and an assistant United States attorney who would eventually be indicted during the Watergate scandal concocted a plan. Three years earlier, a local racist stable burned down and 15 horses died. These various law enforcement officers arranged to have two black convicts, Walter David Washington and Alfred Hood, meet alone in a jail cell and create a clear story that would implicate the Charlotte Three in the arson. Washington was a suspected murderer and Hood had assault and robbery charges. Both men were offered immunity from the arson in their testimony, given $4,000 cash each, and even taken on a three-month supervised trip to North Carolina's Atlantic Beach. The Charlotte Three were indicted in 1972 with this testimony as the key evidence, and the judge overseeing the case was a noted segregationist. Jim Grant had a convincing out-of-state alibi for the night in question, and the judge warned the DA he would consider a defense dismissal motion if no more evidence was provided. Curiously, shortly after this warning, an administrative assistant at a local bank claimed that she suddenly remembered that on the day of the alibi, she saw Grant at the bank. Supporters wondered how she would remember him or what led investigators to that bank in the first place three years after the fact. Grant's apartment had been ransacked in May 1972 and his bank records were missing. This didn't matter though. The jury convicted the Charlotte Three in less than two hours of deliberating. Numerous appeals and media vilification followed, but in 1974, the Charlotte Observer investigated the conspiracy and blew the whistle. The men weren't freed until 1979, when the governor reduced their sentences and allowed their release and still upheld their convictions as just. The criminalization and incarceration of the Charlotte Three tainted the causes they advocated for. Another political prisoner of the 70s was Angela Davis. She was involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other organizations in the 60s and came to see the capitalist economy as the source of many social ills. She joined the Communist Party of the United States in 1969, the same year she was hired to teach philosophy at UCLA. She was fired, however, because of a state law banning communist teachers at state-funded universities. She challenged this in court, got the law overturned, and was eventually rehired but was ultimately forced out of her position. But what led to her being locked up? Angela was a member of the Soledad Brothers Defense Committee, which supported the three imprisoned black men falsely accused of killing a white prison guard in 1969. One of the men, George Jackson, had a brother named Jonathan. In August 1970, Jonathan stole three of Angela's legally registered guns to take hostages from a courtroom, whom he planned to trade for the release of the Soledad Brothers. He was killed in his attempt, and the FBI issued a warrant for Angela's arrest and put her on their 10 most wanted list, despite the fact 
that she wasn't involved. Nixon denounced her as a terrorist. When she was arrested, Aretha Franklin even tried to pay her bail. While Angela spent 18 months in jail, free Angela buttons, posters, and t-shirts became a popular way for black people to exhibit their support. Angela was released from jail in February 1972 on a $102,000 bail and was eventually acquitted of all charges. These types of false charges and convictions plagued activists and organizers and the extent wouldn't be revealed until the whistle blew on Cointel Pro. The early 70s also saw more emphasis on black activists and politicos winning local elections and attempting to work within the system rather than pursuing complete system upheaval. For instance, the Black Panthers reconsolidated and began running for local elections around California. Back in 1971, the predecessor to the Congressional Black Caucus was formed. And by 1971, it had its official name. It was composed of the few black representatives on Capitol Hill. Nixon refused to meet with them, so they boycotted the 1971 State of the Union address and attracted major press coverage. During the same period, voter registration rates among black Southerners doubled, and there was an increase in black politicians and elected officials officials, including the first black Southerners elected to Congress since Reconstruction. The rise in black political representation came from the Voting Rights Act and whites completely abandoning certain districts rather than integrating. By 1977, over 200 cities had black mayors. These mayors inherited budgets plagued by a drop in tax revenue, but they made attempts to level the racial playing field. For example, in Atlanta, the first black mayor, Maynard Jackson, gave greater shares of city contracts to black businesses and minorities as a whole. In 1972, the National Black Political Assembly was held in Gary, Indiana, attracting thousands of black people interested in changing the political landscape. Throughout the fall of 1970 and winter of 1971, various black grassroots organizations elected delegates, raised money for transportation, and spread the word about the assembly. Radical black nationalists were the majority of the attendants, delivering the motto, it's nation time, and advocating for an independent black political party. Moderates supporting integration and Democrats were in the minority. Unfortunately, the assembly didn't change much. The radical grassroots activists didn't have the national visibility to spark change, and the black elected officials in attendance who did have the national visibility wanted to be re-elected and didn't want to lose white allies, so they distanced themselves shortly after. Plus, they believed real politics required compromise, not demands for revolution. Too bad a lot of folks didn't trust the political system. We addressed Watergate in the last episode, but the Cointel Pro and Tuskegee syphilis experiment revelations also contributed to mistrust. During the 1972 election, most black politicos endorsed white Democrats, while core members, who were increasingly conservative and members of the burgeoning black middle class, voted for Nixon because of his pro-business self-reliant stances. Very few white women's organizations, black male politicians, or black organizations with men at the helm supported Shirley Chisholm in her pursuit of the presidency. By the time of the 1976 election, the black voting rate dropped from 52.1% to 49%. The concept of the National Black Political Assembly fell in popularity, and by 1977, membership was down considerably to 300. However, a drop in voting didn't mean black people weren't fighting for political change. The landscape was just different. There were clear fractures in black activism that didn't exist during the Civil Rights Movement, which is part of why the idea of a national black political movement failed. For starters, those at the forefront of the 60s civil rights and black power movements were clergy, middle class students, and later militant black men. In the 70s, there were political prisoners, feminists, lower class blue collar workers, and welfare activists in the spotlight. Mississippian Alfred Skip Robinson established the United League in 1978 saying he was taking up where the movement of the 1960s took off and was careful to include street people. The United League had thousands of members in northern Mississippi, many of whom were former Vietnam vets. It focused on standing up to the Ku Klux Klan, which was seeing a resurgence, fighting illegal land grabs at the local and state levels, and boycotting white businesses that didn't hire black people. Though short-lived, the United League was one of many grassroots organizations that focused on labor issues. That was the second major difference of the 60s black organizers and those of the 70s. A lot more attention was paid to class issues. 
The National Welfare Rights Organization, though established in 1966, started being headed by a poor black mother of six, Johnny Tillman, in the 70s. Back when she met with Martin Luther King in 1968 to hear his plans for the Poor People's Campaign, she and the other welfare mothers in attendance were upset that he didn't include their concerns. She asked him questions about welfare that he couldn't answer and quipped, you know, Dr. King, if you don't know about these questions, you should say you don't know, and then we can go on with the meeting. She went on to explain, I'm a black woman, I'm a poor woman, I'm a fat woman, I'm a middle-aged woman, and I'm on welfare. In this country, if you were any one of those things, you count as less of a human being. If you're all of those things, you don't count at all. Future Atlanta mayor and Martin Luther King confidant Andrew Young confirmed how welfare and class issues were swept aside in the 60s, saying, I guess in the back of our minds, we thought asking for welfare was tactically unsound. If you ask for welfare, you might not get anything. The NWRO spent the early 70s delivering testimony to Congress and storming public areas with picket signs. Remember Nixon's family assistance plan that we covered in the last episode? The NWRO opposed it, noticing that the proposed welfare allowance would be less than the various allowances already available at the time. Their publicity even inspired thousands of eligible black mothers who had been kept from receiving benefits to apply, with local NWRO chapters helping them to do so. The welfare mothers weren't well received in Congress, with conservative Senator Russell Long remarking if they can find time to testify in March, they can find time to do some useful work, like picking up litter. The NWRO fizzled in 1975, but their efforts, along with other grassroots welfare organizations, did change things. More black women than ever before became eligible for welfare, and many states got rid of the requirement that welfare recipients not have male companions. More importantly, the existence of NWRO helped humanize the women receiving welfare, at least until Ronald Reagan came along. Not all black people, or even most black people were open supporters of organizations like the NWRO. Receiving welfare meant relying on a corrupt and racist government. For the black radicals who turned to black cultural nationalism, this meant insisting that blacks should adopt traditional African culture, support black businesses, and be self-reliant. There was a rise in dashikis, black-owned bookstores catering to black readers, the celebration of Kwanzaa, and a lot more grooming of Afros. Donning in-your-face black culture allowed other people to make inferences about your political beliefs. Choosing to wear afros and dashikis was as radical to black conservatives as advocating for black separatism. And many were in a way. Former members of black power and civil rights movements were increasingly suspicious and skeptical of assimilation because often it meant kicking black culture to the curb for white culture and acceptance. Separatism didn't catch on with most black people. In fact, polls showed that whites favored a separate black nation more than we did, but black cultural nationalism did catch on. It was during this time that black culture came to be synonymous with black power, whether that be through art, music, or appearance that rejected white standards. This black Black cultural nationalism increased black autonomy, but black people still were divided among other issues. Some black nationalists insisted that black women should serve as the anchors and second in commands to black men. Dara Abu Bakari, a pan-Africanist black separatist and vice president of the Republic of New Africa, said in a 1970 interview, I feel that the role of the black woman at this point in history is to give sustenance to the black man. At one time, the black woman was the only one that could say something and not get her head chopped off, but the law was strictly against the black man. He could not do anything. Now that he speaks, we speak together. We cannot separate, and this is what I say to the women's lib movement. You cannot separate men from women when you're black. This was one of the many opinions floating around during the growth of the feminist movement. That same year, Ebony published an article titled The Black Woman and Women's Lib, detailing how many black people didn't find feminism necessary. Conservative psychologist Charles Thomas said, the women's movement is a diversion in the same way that the environment movement is a diversion. Like the environmental thing the college kids are flocking into, feminism appeals to middle class whites because in part, it is an activist way to ignore racism. It is avoidance behavior. Poet Gwendolyn Brooks said, Today's black man, at last flamingly assertive and proud, need their black women beside them, not organizing against them. The Ebony journalist even wrote, 
With all the new love making, there is little room for women's lib. This turned out to be untrue and a lot more complicated because black female activists were increasingly getting fed up with the male dominated black power movement and the white dominated women's liberation movement. The same year that article ran, Tony Cade Bambara published The Black Woman, an anthology of poetry, short stories, and essays by literary greats like Nikki Giovanni, Audre Lorde, and Alice Walker. Several black women's groups were founded, including the short-lived National Black Feminist Organization in 1973. The Combahee River Collective, named after Harriet Tubman's legendary military campaign, emerged in 1974 in Boston and developed a statement establishing black feminist theory and objectives, as well as the term Term identity politics. Outspoken black feminist lawyer Florence Kennedy, co-founder of the National Black Feminist Organization, was called the biggest, loudest, and indisputably the rudest mouth on the battleground by Time Magazine. episode, we discussed how the economic recessions that occurred in the 70s were especially rough on lower class black people. But there was a black middle class. Though they certainly weren't always allies to black radicals, their progression scared white Americans as much as black radicals and lower class black Americans living in poverty. As such, segregation ended in most public spheres, but remained in schools and neighborhoods. Cities like Detroit and Cleveland lost huge chunks of their white populations, and by 1970, around 70% of black people lived in cities. At the beginning of the decade, 15.7% of black families had incomes of over 35,000 a year, putting them in the middle class. And this percentage would rise to 21.2% by 1986. Affirmative action and hiring practices in college enrollment meant more black people in places white people weren't used to seeing them. For example, between 1970 and 1986, the black suburban population grew from 3.6 million to 7.1 million. White Americans kicked and screamed this entire time, fleeing deeper into all-white enclaves or protesting. When Swan versus Charlotte Board of Education ruled in 1971 that students would be bused to schools to achieve integration, hell broke loose. White parents in southern states increasingly established private schools that didn't have to adhere to integration policies, earning the name segregation academies. This had been happening since Brown versus Board of Education, but the anti-busing sentiments of the 70s saw an increased interest in these schools. The backlash to busing was particularly bad in Boston and Chicago. Boston School Committee Chairwoman Louise Day Hicks established Restore Our Alienated Rights, or ROAR, in 1974. Stealing tactics from the civil rights movement, they hosted sit-ins, protests, marches, and public prayers, but ultimately disbanded two years later when busing went ahead anyways. These infamous pictures of Theodore Landmark being attacked by white teens in Boston fueled violence on both sides. Parents were also angry about what they viewed as subversive anti-American curriculum that attempted to include minority experiences. A prominent example of this is the Kanawha County Textbook Wars of 1974, in which West Virginian parents bombed buildings and sent death threats to stop their children from learning about Malcolm X and other black people. That same year, Milliken versus Bradley ruled that suburban segregation, or white people fleeing the areas where they refused to sell homes or land to black people and other minorities, was unintentional. The case struck down Detroit's plans to integrate schools by busing in students across 53 district lines, ruling that the city of Detroit could use busing within city limits but had to leave suburbs out of it. Racist universities like Bob Jones University struggled to hold on to their tax-exempt status in the face of mandatory integration policies. The IRS warned Bob Jones to integrate, so in 1975 they admitted black students only if they were married to stop any potential for interracial dating. The IRS still took away their tax-exempt status the next year, and this would be a rallying point for the new right in the years to come. Parents also weren't pleased that affirmative action was upheld in 1978's Regents of the University of California versus Bake, which allowed race to be considered in college admissions but struck down racial quotas. 
I also have to mention that the late 70s saw a growth in KKK allegiance. Between 1975 and 1979, Klan membership jumped from 6,500 to 10,000, with an estimated 75,000 active sympathizers who read Klan literature or attended rallies but weren't card-carrying members. This revival of the Klan's image came through the good PR of David Duke, who appeared on TV in suits and appeared less threatening than the typical hooded Grand Wizard. He encouraged women and Catholics to join and insisted that his organization was pro-white, pro-Christian, and non-violent, but not pro-black. All different kinds of KKK groups existed on numerous college campuses, and in some parts of the country, they joined in on protests involving busing, affirmative action, and textbooks. Many black people tried to ascend the social ladder through education and succeeded. The bulk of black Americans remained in poor black neighborhoods. It was also during the 70s that these black neighborhoods saw an increase in liquor stores and fast food establishments. The early 70s also saw a rise in graffiti, though this was common in many urban areas and not just among black youth. By the late 1970s, the MTA was spending $400,000 a year cleaning trains. The black ghetto was represented in TV shows and black exploitation films that were popular among black and white audiences. Black exploitation films were born from the realization that urban area theaters needed to cater to black audiences and reflected the growing sentiment of black cultural nationalism. Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, which premiered in 1971, was the largest grossing independent film at the time. Black exploitation flicks focused on the lives of black ghetto residents, emphasized black pride, community unity, and black power with highly stereotypical characters. The crime depicted in black exploitation films were a realistic reflection of crime in black neighborhoods, exacerbated by the economic crisis that forced many to turn to drug selling, robbing, pimping, and prostituting. Urban decay fueled mass incarceration as prison sentences were increased for many crimes. Black people were disproportionately arrested for drugs and given longer sentences than white people. One of the most prominent examples of black urban decay is the Bronx, which was devastated by white flight, city mismanagement and neglect, greedy landlords, and fires. To be clear, most of the population was Latino, but black people came in a close second. According to the New York Post, seven different census tracts in the Bronx lost more than 97% of their buildings to fire and abandonment between 1970 and 1980. 44 tracts out of 289 in the borough lost more than 50%. In the late 70s, 42% of New York's working age population was unemployed. The sense of despair in the Bronx culminated during the blackout of 1977, which saw thousands of looting incidents and millions in property damage. Reported Time Magazine that year, what shocked the city and much of the world was that tens of thousands of blacks and Hispanics poured from their tenements and barrios in 16 areas to produce an orgy of looting. In Brooklyn's Bed-Stuy Ghetto, in Manhattan's Harlem, in the South Bronx, the violence and plundering approached the levels of the 1968 riots after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. City leaders and national commentators showed contempt towards looters, while a select few highlighted the roots of their rage. If you turn out the lights, the folks will steal, especially if they're hungry. You've got to realize that in New York, you're running at unemployment levels of about 30 to 40 percent amongst young adults, said Andrew Young. The theft of expensive DJing equipment during that blackout would help turn hip pop from a local trend in the Bronx to one that reached other boroughs and the world. So black culture was slowly penetrating the mainstream. Black Americans were becoming more numerous in professional fields and they were a lot more vocal about black and class issues. We've covered a lot in this episode and all of it from black changes in politics to the growing prominence of black culture served as the backdrop for the punch heard around the world. Kermit Washington would go on to insist that he didn't punch Rudy Tomjanovich on purpose, but the damage was done and his career would never recover. His punch to white basketball fans and white people who became invested in the punch was additional straw on the camel's back. Black Americans spent the 1960s being politically disruptive and after begrudging concessions like the Voting Rights Act, 
further political disruption in the 70s was seen as ungrateful, unjustified, and criminalistic behavior. The rise of black culture and black pride, just like the rise in black players in the NBA, scared white Americans who wanted to return to the old status quo. As we'll find out in episode five, the rise in black cultural nationalism and political action, along with the culture wars and the rise of feminism, helped mobilize the new right. But before all that, in the next episode, we'll be talking about why the 70s are known as the me decade. Want to see more great long format videos like this? Well, you can over on Patreon, where a one to three dollar monthly pledge grants you access to exclusive videos and essays. Plus, your pledge produces more great free content like this. Check the link in the description box below for more information. Also, be sure to like this video and subscribe.